I'll be honest, the BenQ Mobius EX2510 was not on my list of monitors to review, mainly because I don't care about 144Hz monitors. But since BenQ reached out and said, hey, want one to review? How could I say no? And I'm glad they asked, because this is in all respects a great monitor. Not only is it my favorite 1080p 144Hz gaming monitor, which just so happens to have the added benefit of having an IPS panel, but I'd go as far as to say that this is the best 1080p 144Hz gaming monitor. How and why, you may ask? Well, not only does it perform super well in gaming performance, but it's got so many features that, I must admit, I thought I wouldn't care about. But after using them, found that they made day-to-day -day use noticeably better. A quality of life thing, if you will. Before we begin, two things. One, this is the 25-inch model and costs $250. There is a 27-inch model called the EX2710 if you are interested in that, which costs $300. I personally went with the 25-inch model simply because of pixel density. And two, I want to thank BenQ for sending me this monitor to review. As always, any company that decides to send me a product will go through the same scrutiny as if I purchased this with my own money as I work for myself, not for them. They have no say or intervention on how I would want to present a product, nor do they get an early preview. They're watching this at the same time as you guys. With that out of the way, let's begin with the things that matter most in a gaming monitor, it's gaming performance. This thing actually surprised me. Starting with the pixel response time, BenQ advertises this monitor to have a one millisecond response time, but as regular viewers already know, I don't care about advertised numbers, I care about results. So does it actually deliver? The EX2510 has four levels of overdrive, or as BenQ calls it, advanced motion acceleration, or AMA for short. Zero, one, two, and three. It also includes ELMB, which is called blur reduction, but we'll get to that. Starting with the AMA set to zero, things look about average for 144Hz. And since I've only reviewed one other 144Hz monitor, the AOC C24G1, I'm not even gonna bother comparing the EX2510 to the AOC for two reasons. One, this obliterates that, and two, this performs so well, it hangs in there with the 240Hz big boys. To show you what I mean, let me show you a comparison between the EX2510 and the best 240Hz gaming monitor, the BenQ Zowie XL2546, when it's set to 144Hz. By the way, I'm waiting for my XL2546K to come in, so subscribe if you don't want to miss that review. Anyway, this is the Mobius EX2510, and this is the BenQ Zowie XL2546S. Not bad. And keep in mind, the Mobius has an IPS panel, whereas the Zowie has a TN panel, so the Mobius is doing extremely well. But wait! There's more, because if we set the AMA to one, two, and then three, things get noticeably cleaner, producing less ghosts than with the AMA set to zero, while not introducing any overshoot. The same can't be said when it comes to the Zowie, where it introduces a bit more than desired overshoot. Okay, the Mobius is doing very well so far, especially for an IPS panel, but what about ELMB? The Zowie has Diac Plus where it not only produces super crisp results as if a photo were taken rather than me recording on a slider, but does so without sacrificing any brightness. Does the Mobius carry the same tech as a Zowie? Well, yes, but also no. First off, let's all praise the glorious results that the Mobius gives us with the blur reduction turned- wait, what? That's not a UFO, that's a like button! Basically, that's me hinting to you that you should hit the like button. I mean, come on, it's free. Anyway, enabling the blur reduction gives us fantastic clarity. Even better is that no matter which AMA you set it to, it'll stay this way, unlike the Zowie, which will give you some overshoot with the higher AMA settings. The best thing about the blur reduction tech in the Mobius is that it takes a page from Zowie's book by maintaining a very high peak brightness of 260 nits. It's not quite the 330 nits like the Zowie, but 260 nits is still plenty bright for pretty much everything. This is something every monitor I've tested that isn't a certain BenQ product fails to do so far, which is why I praise Zowie monitors in particular when it comes to the pixel response time. Every other monitor I've tested so far always cuts the peak brightness by at least half when enabling their respective ELMB. Now it's not all perfect because unlike the Zowie, the Mobius isn't able to use the blur reduction at 60 Hz like you can with Diac Plus. But I won't be taking points away for it because Zowie is the only monitor I've seen so far that can use ELMB at 60 Hz. Anyway, the best overdrive setting is the blur reduction, which produces fantastic results. I would also recommend using it pretty much all the time since there are basically no negatives other than some people that are sensitive to backlight strobing, which can give users a headache. If you know you're one of those people, I would recommend using the highest AMA setting since it produces the best results without any overshoot. 
If you're playing at 60 Hz or continuously fluctuate between 144 Hz and down to 60, I would recommend using the 1 AMA setting since going to 2 or 3 introduces overshoot at 60 Hz. Okay, next is the black equalizer, which the EX2510 has two different types of? Let me explain. You have your traditional black equalizer that I always talk about, which adjusts the gamma of black and gray shades of colors so you can easily see enemies hiding in dark areas such as shadows. Real quick, I've already said this in the Zowie video, but if you're one of those people that are going to cry in the comments because a black equalizer is cheating, or that's not how the developer intended the game to be played, then either skip this part, close the video, or keep crying because like it or not, people that want an advantage, such as me, will use this feature. Anyway, the Mobius also includes a different type of black equalizer called Light Tuner, which BenQ says is kind of like a black equalizer, but not totally, with the difference being that it's supposed to uncover hidden details that would otherwise be hidden if the scene was darker. Now I'll be honest, I tested both of these to see if I noticed any difference between the two technologies, and there really wasn't one, so I'll just show you my standard testing. Starting with Escape from Tarkov with the black equalizer off, things actually don't look too dark. I've seen darker, but I would prefer to have a brighter scene to be able to see enemies easier. Moving to 1, things are brighter, 5 increases the image slightly, and 10 makes everything pretty much visible. And when it comes to the light tuner, it makes everything ever so slightly brighter. The same happens when you have the light tuner set to 1 and 5, and compared to the black equalizer set to 1 and 5. The light tuner is ever so slightly more visible, but you probably won't notice this difference in-game. The monitor also includes a color vibrance feature so you can add more color to games with grayscale-ish color themes, such as Escape from Tarkov, which works regardless if you use the black equalizer or the light tuner. Next we have Rainbow Six Siege. Here's the black equalizer set to 0, 1, 5, and then 10. And here's with color tuner set to 10, which looks slightly more washed out than a black equalizer. But that won't matter because again, there's a color ribbons feature which allows you to add more colors when needed to distinguish your enemy from their background so you can react quicker without second guessing yourself wondering if what you're looking at is an enemy or some part of the map. So overall, the black equalizer and light tuner works extremely well and you won't have any complaints. Next is input lag. As always, I don't have any actual data on input lag since I don't have a way to test it, so you can take this with as much grains of salt as you'd want. But based on what I see and feel as a high skilled level player, responsiveness is extremely good. It's up there with some of the best 144Hz monitors, and actually feels as good as some 240Hz displays, just like this water bottle feels super good coming from this water bottle from LTTstore.com. Okay, now you know its gaming performance is good, so what was I talking about earlier when I said there are some features this monitor has that I thought I wouldn't use, but I ended up liking? Well, there are three things that BenQ is trying to distinguish this monitor from every other monitor in this category, which are the speakers, eye care, and HDRI, or HDR intelligence. Also, part of the agreement was that they wanted me to talk about it, so I really have no choice. Let's start with the speakers. I don't usually talk about speakers on monitor reviews, mainly because monitors that include speakers either don't exist, or if they do, almost always suck. That's not the case here. The EX2510 comes with two 2.5 watt Trevolo speakers, which the reviewer's guide says is for audio immersion, which is an absolute lie. With a combined output of 5 watts, it's not immersive, far from that. But that's not to say they're bad, because they're actually very good for monitor speakers. Before this monitor came in, I always had to wear headsets to hear basically anything. Now that's not necessarily a problem, because I love the sounds coming from my Bayer Dynamics MX300 Gen 2s, which I will review sometime in the future. But being that I'm a reviewer and I'm forced to use everything on a product to give you that information, turns out, for anything that doesn't require enthusiast level sound quality, amazing soundstage, and so on, which is basically almost anything I do that isn't watching a movie or playing games, I actually found myself preferring the built-in speakers on the EX2510s rather than having to put my headset on and take them off every time I need to leave my desk, which is pretty often. Also, I'm able to watch videos with my girlfriend without having to leave my headset on my desk, cranked, hoping we can both hear what we're watching. Basically, it's the convenience factor that sold me because I love convenience. Also, they get pretty loud and at max volume, still have good clarity without introducing any distortion or rattling. I 
I'd say they're almost as good as my 16-inch MacBook Pro speakers, with the exception of not being as clear and not quite as loud, but not far off. And I do enjoy the speakers on my 16-inch MacBook Pro. One last thing about the speakers before we move on to the other stuff. The bass is simulated, so it's not true bass. There is no subwoofer to give you that true bassy feel, but the simulation is fine and doesn't sound displeasing. If I wanted a fantastic experience, then I'll just use my headset or my sound system on my TV. Next is eye care. There are three main features of eye care. BI plus or brightness intelligence plus, low blue light and color weakness. The low blue light is pretty obvious. It lowers the amount of blue light and color weakness is great for the colorblind as you have a red and green filter, which lets you adjust whatever you need so you can distinguish colors easier. Then we have brightness intelligence plus, which I personally appreciate. What BI Plus does is it measures the ambient lighting in your room with the ambient light sensor, measures the current screen brightness, and automatically increases and decreases the screen brightness when needed, as well as adjusting the color temperature. I think it's pretty useful because I like to keep my window shades open and that lets in a lot of sunlight, which in turn means I need a higher screen brightness to compete with the sun. Then as it gets darker, the monitor automatically lowers the screen brightness without me having to do any of that, which in turn helps prevent eye strain and headaches. All of this is adjustable as well, including three functions. You have on and off, which just turns the function on and off. Light meter, which lets you turn on and off this little eye that tells you how bright or dark your monitor is adjusting to. And sensor sensitivity, which tells the sensor how sensitive you want it to respond to the ambient lighting. The only thing I disliked about enabling BI Plus is that you can't adjust most of the monitor settings. You have to first turn BI Plus off, then go on about your business. Lastly, for the things that I thought I wouldn't care for, which I actually still don't, is the HDRI or HDR intelligence. They like putting intelligence in a lot of their naming, don't they? You have an HDRI button on the bottom right of the monitor, which cycles through four different settings. Game HDRI, Cinema HDRI, HDR, and off. We'll start with BenQ's marketing claims. BenQ says that it uses the ambient light sensor on the bottom of the monitor as well as some algorithm magic to constantly adjust the HDR effect based on the lighting in your area. In turn, this should lead to a better viewing experience when you're on two of the HDR intelligent modes. They also claim that the HDR intelligent modes have the smarts to add HDR to non-HDR content without exaggerating brightness or dark areas. This all sounds like marketing fluff, so how does it actually perform? Let's start with HDR, then we'll move to the emulated HDR. HDR, with or without intelligence modes, performs okay. It's not going to win any awards except for being the only monitor I've tested so far to actually not overexpose bright areas to the point where the image looks like you crank the contrast to 100. There are actually some benefits to be gained here whether you're on game HDRI, cinema HDRI, or just standard HDR. The game and cinema intelligent modes did do what it said by adjusting the levels of brightness to try and give me a better HDR effect, but the overall experience wasn't that great since I kept seeing the entire screen's brightness increase and decrease, particularly when the sun outside just temporarily covered a cloud, so I ended up preferring the standard HDR and SDR instead. The same applies when I use the emulated HDR modes. The game and cinema intelligent modes were not as visually pleasing as SDR or the standard HDR mode, so I would personally keep it on SDR or standard HDR when using this monitor's HDR. But as I mentioned earlier, the Mobius did much better than any other VESA HDR 400 certified gaming monitor I've used so far, mainly because they overexpose everything, making the image look like a hot mess, which wasn't the case here on the standard HDR mode. So in short, I wouldn't go out of my way to use the HDR, but it does actually add some visual benefits, but don't expect much. It's not like it's mind blowing or anything like that. The monitor is $250. Next is gambit coverage and color accuracy, which fares way better. BenQ advertises this monitor to have 99% coverage of the sRGB color space, but my color emitter determined that was a lie, covering only 95%. Though I doubt you'll be complaining with 95%. It also covers 69%, nice, of the Adobe RGB color space, which isn't nice if you're a photo editor, and covers 78% of the DCI-P3 color space, making it good enough for amateur video editors. When uncalibrated, the EX2510 produces average results, giving an average Delta E of 3.59. So colors are not 100% accurate, but for an IPS panel, this is totally fine and you won't be looking at this monitor thinking that colors are too off. 
It also gave a good peak brightness of 315 nits with a contrast ratio of 1143 to 1, which beats the advertised 1001, which is nice since I'm used to seeing lower than advertised results with plenty of other monitors. When calibrated, the EX2510 gives impeccable results, producing an average Delta E of 0.44, which to the human eye is perfect as is anything with a Delta E of below 1. It also gave a slightly higher brightness of 358 nits and a higher contrast ratio of 1181 to 1. If you want to know how to calibrate your monitor, I made a guide not too long ago which you can check out by clicking on the pop out banner over here and with a link in the video description. And also if you want to download my ICC color profile to try for yourself, I'll leave a link to my website in the video description as well. Don't get too excited about that though because I've been too lazy to upload information on the last three monitors so this might be a fourth but I will get to it eventually. Another thing that is pretty good about this monitor, as with pretty much most IPS monitors, is the viewing angles. It does very well from all angles, adding no angle discoloration and maintaining a good image. Next is the on-screen display. This is probably the weakest part of the monitor. You have one button which only cycles through the available video sources as well as a single nipple to navigate through the full OSD. You can access the quick settings by pushing the nipple left or right, and volume by pushing it up or down. One thing I don't like is that when you push the nipple in, it accesses the quick menu instead of accessing the full OSD, and as far as I can tell, there was no way to change that. I don't need a third way to access the quick menu. Once you're in the full OSD, you could change your input source, quick menu, which is quite confusing actually. Actually, let's talk about that for a minute. In the quick menu, you have your color mode, which is fine, whatever. But if you look at the orange text, it says DisplayPort Standard. Then if you go to the quick menu on the full OSD, you can choose either Standard, Game, and Cinema and select whatever shortcut function you want. Okay, so you may be wondering, what's the big deal then? Well, the big deal is that from that menu, you can't choose if you want to be on Game, Standard, or Cinema. To do that, you have to go to the Input Source selection, go to whatever source you're on, and then change it from there. Since I only use one display at a time and don't have multiple devices connected to one monitor, I don't see how this is useful. This might be useful if you have a console or multiple PCs connected to one monitor, but I doubt it. All it did was confuse me on what settings I was selecting. What is nice though is that the quick menu settings let you change the shortcuts to whatever you want as long as the color profile supports it. And while we're talking about color profiles, if you open the quick menu, you can quickly change your color mode by pushing the nipple left or right. On the full OSD menu of the color mode, you can adjust the black equalizer, light tuner, color vibrance, brightness, contrast, gamma, color temps, AMA or overdrive, blur reduction or ELMB, and reset all your settings. Next is the eye care stuff like I mentioned earlier, audio, and system which has your typical standard OSD system settings. Now apart from the initially confusing input source modes, the rest of the OSD is fine. So then why did I say that it's the weakest part of the monitor? Well, that's because that's about the only thing, apart from the HDRI, that didn't perform exceptionally well like the rest of the monitor's features. It doesn't have any software OSD to easily control everything via software, like most other companies offer, and it doesn't offer anything similar to Zowie's S-Switch remote. If they added software support in the future, if that's possible, that would make this OSD a lot better, especially if you can tie an app to one of the profiles of the monitor so you don't have to keep fiddling with the nipple. Though, now that I say that out loud, doesn't sound too bad to fiddle with nipples. Lastly, we have the design and smaller details. The EX2510 is quite nice. It's quite contemporary looking with some gamer touches here and there. The base is made of metal and is covered with a silver plastic and some oddly placed orange rubber trim. I'm personally not a fan of the orange, maybe red would have been better, but it is removable with a bit of manual labor in case you don't like it. Just remove all the screws, including the black plastic trim and the screws hiding under the rubber grips, remove the metal base, take the trim out, and voila! Just make sure if you do remove the orange trim, do not use a powered screwdriver to screw the screws back into their thread, otherwise you're going to strip thread like I did with three of my screws. Going back to the monitor, the stand and the monitor is made of high quality plastic. For I.O. or input output, it includes a headphone jack, two HDMI 2.0 ports, one DisplayPort 1.2 port, and a Kensington lock. There is no USB Type-A hub, so the I.O. is pretty lackluster but it includes all the necessities at least. It also includes an I.O. cover and the stand has a wire routing hole so wires look less messy. The legs spread out which I typically don't like, but that's mainly because they usually take up a lot of desk space. 
In this case, the overall footprint is quite small at about eight and a quarter inches from the back to the front of the base and 13 inches wide. Super small footprint and I like it that way. The front of the monitor is quite nice, including your standard thin bezels with a thick chin including BenQ's branding. It also includes the ambient light sensor. It has tilt, height, and swivel adjustments, but no pivot, which if you use a monitor arm or stand, won't be an issue since it has 100 by 100 VESA mounting support. Now that you know everything you need to know, is this monitor worth $250? Well, if you want the short answer, I give it a resounding yes. Apart from the lackluster HDR and OSD not having an easy way to switch between profiles, you can just use the standard profile for your default and use the profiles right beside the standard one for games and it won't be too annoying. Apart from that, the overdrive and especially that ELMB performs so well. Better than even some 240Hz monitors set to 144Hz. I just don't want to bore you with 10 different monitors. The black equalizer and color tuner perform super well as well doing as good as the XL2546S. The input lag felt super low, which is obviously great for gaming. The speakers and the automatic light adjustment made casual slash general PC use a whole lot better since I didn't need to constantly put my headset on and take it off and not adjust my brightness when it gets dark, though not everyone will care about that as much as me. And the overall media consumption experience is good as well. It's not as good as say a nano IPS panel, but being that it's an IPS panel and performs just as well as a TN panel, not only can you have your cake, but you can eat it too. Now sure, there are other 144Hz monitors that are cheaper, but that's not a challenge. What I challenge you to do is find one that not only offers all these features, but have those features perform as well as the EX2510, all for the same price or cheaper. If you can, point me to it and maybe I'll do a review of that as well, but I think you're going to have a hard time. Thanks for sticking around to the end of the video or just skipping to the conclusion, that's fine. If you guys enjoyed the video, leave a like. If not, leave a dislike. If you'd like to find out any of the stuff that I featured in this video, where to buy it, check out the links in the video description. As an Amazon associate, I earn from qualifying purchases. If you want to follow me on my socials, check the pinned comments as well as in the description. And other than that, have a great day, every day. Peace.